And welcome to our session on data plane versus control plane in networking. I'm really excited to dive into these fundamental concepts with you today. Understanding how these two planes work together is absolutely essential for anyone working with modern networks, whether you're just starting out or you've been in the field for years. Throughout our session, we'll explore what makes these planes unique, how they interact, and why this separation matters so much in today's networking landscape. By the end, you'll have a solid grasp of these concepts that you can apply directly to your work. So let's get started. First, let's establish what we mean by data plane and control plane. Think of it like a transportation system. The data plane is like the actual roads and vehicles that move people and goods from point A to point B. It's all about the movement of traffic. The control plane, on the other hand, is like the traffic management system. The traffic lights, signs, and traffic controllers that decide which routes vehicles should take, how to handle congestion, and what to do when there's an accident. In networking terms, the data plane is responsible for actually forwarding packets, moving data from source to destination. It's the doing part of the network. The control plane makes decisions about where that data should go. It's the thinking part. These two planes work together to form a complete network architecture. The control plane figures out the best paths and sets up the rules, and the data plane follows those rules to actually move the traffic. This separation might seem simple, but it's actually a fundamental concept that shapes how networks are designed and operated. Now, let's take a closer look at the data plane. Remember our transportation analogy? The data plane is where the actual work gets done. It's the muscle of the network. The primary function of the data plane is forwarding packets based on the decisions made by the control plane. When a packet arrives at a router or switch, the data plane looks at its destination and quickly sends it on its way using predetermined paths. Key components of the data plane include forwarding tables, like a map that tells where to send traffic, switching fabrics, the internal pathways that move data through the device, and network interfaces, the connection points to the network. Some examples of data plane technologies include Ethernet switching at layer 2, IP routing at layer 3, and even MPLS label switching. These technologies all focus on one thing, moving data as efficiently as possible. Performance is critical for the data plane. We're talking about handling millions or even billions of packets per second. That's why data plane functions are often implemented in specialized hardware like ASICs or NPUs. They need to operate at line speed to keep up with network demands. Think of it this way. If the data plane were a postal worker, it would be the person who quickly sorts and delivers mail based on pre-labeled routes without stopping to question where each package should go. Now, let's turn our attention to the control plane, the brains of the network. While the data plane handles the physical movement of data, the control plane makes all the important decisions about how that data should move. The control plane is responsible for routing decisions figuring out the best paths through the network. It also handles topology discovery, learning about the network layout and what devices are connected where. Key components include routing protocols like OSPF, BGP, and EIGRP, which exchange information to build a picture of the network. There are also control plane processors, typically the CPU and network devices that run these protocols and make decisions. Unlike the data plane, which is all about speed, the control plane is about intelligence and adaptability. It needs to understand the bigger picture of the network and make smart decisions about how to route traffic. When there's a change in the network, like a link going down, it's the control plane that detects this change, recalculates routes, and updates the forwarding tables that the data plane uses. If we go back to our postal worker analogy, the control plane would be the postal services management system that decides the delivery routes, updates them when roads close, and ensures the most efficient delivery paths are used. So how do these two planes work together? It's a fascinating relationship that's crucial to network operation. The control plane populates the forwarding tables that the data plane uses. When the control plane determines the best path to a destination, it installs this information in the forwarding table. 
The data plane then simply looks up these pre-computed paths when forwarding packets. Communication between the planes happens through various protocols and mechanisms. For example, in traditional routers, the control plane, running in the CPU, updates the forwarding table in the data plane, often in specialized hardware. This separation of concerns is really important. By keeping the decision-making separate from the packet forwarding, we can optimize each plane for its specific task. The data plane can focus on speed and efficiency while the control plane can focus on intelligence and adaptability. Think about it this way. If you had to make a new decision about every single packet that came through, your network would be incredibly slow. By pre-computing these decisions in the control plane, the data plane can handle packets at lightning speed. This separation also contributes to network stability. If the control plane experiences issues, maybe a routing protocol is misbehaving, the data plane can often continue forwarding packets using the last known good information, preventing a complete network meltdown. To better understand these planes, let's compare them directly across several key dimensions. First, purpose. The data plane's purpose is to forward packets quickly and efficiently. The control plane's purpose is to make intelligent decisions about where those packets should go. Speed is another major difference. The data plane operates at line speed, as fast as the hardware can possibly handle. The control plane operates at a much more leisurely pace, measured in milliseconds or seconds rather than nanoseconds. When it comes to intelligence, the data plane is relatively dumb. It just follows pre-programmed instructions. The control plane is where the real intelligence lies, making complex decisions based on network conditions. Scalability differs too. The data plane scales horizontally. We can add more forwarding capacity as needed. The control plane often scales vertically, requiring more powerful processors to handle larger networks. In terms of resilience, the data plane is typically more stable. It keeps working even if the control plane has issues. The control plane is more complex and therefore more prone to problems, but it's also more adaptable when issues arise. Finally, evolution. The data plane evolves relatively slowly, with hardware changes taking years to develop and deploy. The control plane evolves much more quickly, especially with software-defined approaches. Understanding these differences helps us design better networks by leveraging the strengths of each plane where they matter most. Let's look at how these concepts play out in real-world networking scenarios. In traditional router architectures, like those from Cisco or Juniper, we see a clear separation between the control plane, running on the main CPU, and the data plane, often implemented in specialized ASICs. The CPU runs routing protocols, builds routing tables, and then downloads the forwarding information to the ASICs, which handle the actual packet forwarding. Software-defined networking, or SDN, takes this separation to the extreme. In SDN, the control plane is completely removed from individual network devices and centralized in a controller. This controller has a global view of the entire network and makes all the routing decisions, then pushes down forwarding rules to the data plane elements, which become simple packet forwarding devices. Network function virtualization, or NFV, is another interesting application. Here, network functions like firewalls or load balancers that were traditionally implemented in hardware are now virtualized and can run on standard servers. The control plane manages these virtual functions, deciding where they should be deployed and how traffic should flow through them, while the data plane handles the actual traffic processing. In service provider networks, we often see complex interactions between the planes. Providers use protocols like BGP in the control plane to determine how traffic flows between their network and others, while sophisticated data plane implementations ensure that traffic is forwarded efficiently at massive scale. These examples show how the separation between data plane and control plane isn't just theoretical, it's a practical approach that enables different networking architectures to solve different problems. The concepts of data plane and control plane have evolved significantly over time, and they continue to evolve today. 
In the early days of networking, devices were essentially monolithic. There was no clear separation between control and data functions. Everything was implemented in software running on general purpose processors. As networks grew and performance demands increased, we saw the emergence of specialized hardware for data plane functions. This allowed for much higher throughput while still maintaining complex control plane capabilities in software. The real revolution came with software-defined networking, which completely separated the control plane from the data plane and centralized it. This approach gave network operators unprecedented control and flexibility, allowing them to program the network as a whole rather than configuring individual devices. Today, we're seeing even more evolution with technologies like intent-based networking, which allows administrators to express what they want the network to do, rather than how to do it. The system then translates these intents into specific configurations for both control and data planes. We're also seeing the emergence of programmable data planes with languages like P4, which allow network operators to define exactly how packets should be processed, giving them fine-grained control over data plane behavior. Looking to the future, we can expect to see more integration of artificial intelligence and machine learning in both planes. AI could help the control plane make more intelligent decisions about routing and resource allocation, while ML could optimize data plane functions for specific traffic patterns. The separation between data plane and control plane has proven to be a powerful architectural pattern, and it will continue to evolve as networking technology advances. Now that we understand the concepts and evolution, let's discuss some best practices for implementing and managing data plane and control plane architectures. First and foremost is maintaining a clear separation of concerns. Don't blur the lines between what the control plane does and what the data plane does. Each should have well-defined responsibilities and interfaces. When it comes to scalability, remember that these planes scale differently. The data plane scales horizontally by adding more forwarding capacity, while the control plane often scales vertically by adding more processing power. Design your network with this in mind. Security is critical for both planes but in different ways. The control plane needs to be protected from unauthorized access that could allow attackers to manipulate routing decisions. The data plane needs security mechanisms to prevent malicious traffic from impacting network performance. For monitoring and troubleshooting, you'll need different approaches for each plane. Control plane issues often involve routing protocols or configuration errors, while data plane problems might involve hardware failures or congestion. Resilience is another important consideration. The data plane should be designed to continue operating even if the control plane experiences issues. This might involve features like non-stop forwarding or graceful restart, which allow the data plane to keep using pre-computed forwarding information even when the control plane is temporarily unavailable. Finally, always consider the interaction between the planes when designing your network. How will control plane decisions impact data plane performance? How will data plane feedback inform control plane decisions? Thinking about these interactions will help you build more robust and efficient networks. As we wrap up, let's recap what we've learned about data plane and control plane in networking. We've seen that the data plane is responsible for actually forwarding packets. It's the muscle of the network that moves data from source to destination. The control plane is the brains that makes decisions about where that data should go. These two planes work together in a carefully orchestrated dance. The control plane determines the best paths and sets up the rules, and the data plane follows those rules to move traffic efficiently. This separation allows each plane to be optimized for its specific task. We've explored how this concept has evolved over time, from monolithic network devices to today's software-defined architectures, and we've looked at real-world applications that leverage the separation. Understanding these concepts is fundamental to modern networking. Whether you're designing a small enterprise network or a massive service provider infrastructure, thinking in terms of data plane and control plane will help you build more robust, scalable, and efficient networks. Thank you for your attention today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.